Greetings, true believers! I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love! And welcome to a bit of unfinished business regarding a bump in the road to the Avengers. You see, way, way back before the Blipocalypse, I reviewed Iron Man 2. But I spent more time talking about related topics, like the history of Iron Man, Elon Musk, and Robert Downey Jr. than I did on the film. I actually barely spent any time talking about the film itself. Let's rectify that now. Released in 2010, Iron Man 2 is the middle part of a loose trilogy that bookends the first phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This time around, Tony's alter ego is known to the world, which isn't such good news when the son of a former Stark employee sets his sights on Tony's empire, as does a US senator who argues that the Iron Man suit should be used to defend the USA from copycat attacks. And worse, in the run-up to Tony's birthday, he discovers that the arc reactor that's keeping him alive is also killing him. So fire up your repulsors and get ready for the roller coaster ride that is Shellhead's second outing, Iron Man 2. It's six months later, and Tony Stark is introducing the year-long Stark Expo. But the heavy metals that power the arc reactor are leaching into his blood, slowly poisoning him. And worse, his eye for the ladies leads him to testify before a US Senate committee. Of course, at this time, we have no idea that this is actually a Hydra plot to get its hands on the Iron Man suits. Indeed, we won't even know of Hydra until Captain America the First Avenger. Although with his trademark wit and style, Tony proves that he's more than a decade ahead of the game. Back at Tony's California mansion, Pepper Potts is given quite the promotion. And the notary to the paperwork is notable enough in herself. And as you've all noticed, yes, that is Black Widow masquerading as a Stark employee. And why? Oh, you'll find out. But not just yet. The plot really gets going at the Monaco GP, where our hero elects to drive his team's car himself. And we meet our villain, Whiplash. But Tony's been working on a little something, which comes in very handy here. And they fight. Long story short, Iron Man wins. But not without taking a few hits along the way. Our hero converses with Whiplash, alias Ivan Vanko. But just in Hammer, a rival of Stark's who was watching from afar, arranges a meeting with Vanko, which seems to go well enough. Very good man. Very good man. Very good. <laughs> but Vanko is leagues ahead of Pretender Hammer. You see, Hammer wanted suits. Iron Man style suits. Suits that he could sell to the military. Vanko proposed drones. Oh sure, he gave Hammer some guff about drones being better. But in reality, Vanko's plan all along was to create drones under his command so that he could wreak his terrible vengeance for. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that part. For now, let's move on. Back in California, it's Tony's birthday, and a lavish and magnificent party is totally ruined by Tony's own self-destructiveness. Rhodey steps up to try and restore sanity, and a drunken brawl ensues. Hey, Tony, take it! Now, it's around about this point that we learn why Black Widow is in this movie at all. World building wise, they wanted to introduce Black Widow. But plot wise, it's because they wanted to keep Tony safe when they learned that he was unwell. The next morning, Rhodey retrieves a suit, 
while Nick Fury has a few words for Tony. Now, it's about this point in the movie that we learn the history of Ivan Vanko. You see, Ivan's father, Anton, worked with Tony's father, Howard, back in the 50s and 60s. Howard Stark was interested in a warm light for all mankind, but Anton Vanko saw only profit. And when Howard caught Anton selling secrets, Stark had him deported. And now, the sons are fighting a battle for the sins of the fathers. Oh my. Tony cleans out his office and rediscovers his father's legacy, which serves as a replacement core for his arc reactor. Oh, wow, yeah! And just in time, as Vanko's villainous vengeance is revealed. Whoa, whoa. Hey man, gotta love alliteration. And while Iron Man and War Machine take care of Vanko's fully operational drones, Pepper Potts takes charge behind the scenes. And of course, Black Widow gets a proper introduction. But Vanko isn't at Hammer HQ. and looks to make short work of our heroes. But for a double repulsor event. But Vanko never intended to be taken alive. And so our movie ends with another step towards the Avengers initiative. And a medal of honor for our heroes. So that, once again, was Iron Man 2. And I just have to put this one into the House of Love, even if I hadn't done before. It was here that it all really started, and it isn't hard to see why. It's another fantastic high-octane popcorn flick with a touch of soul. Director Jon Favreau's masterstroke is the improvised naturalistic dialogue. The movie flows on charismatic characters. The menace of Mickey Rourke's vengeful Vonko, the smarmy snake oil salesman shtick of Rockwell's Justin Hammer, plus of course the returning core of Stark himself and his entourage, who go without saying. Iron Man 2 is both visceral and intellectual, an introspective art movie of a man in disarray, and a blockbuster spectacle where hero fights villain in a grand climax. Where it really falls down though, I feel, is that Pepper has lost a lot of likability in this movie, and a lot of agency even as he takes charge backstage when it all goes to pot. She still has to be saved at least once, and she gets very few actually human moments, which is a shame for what she was in the first movie. Overall though, Iron Man 2 stands as the gateway to a franchise that is still introducing new elements and characters to this very day. I've been Funky Monkey, wishing you good days and great entertainment. So long! folks.